I want you to forget the terror wrought upon our lives. And so that's why I got all upset when these little folk came out on the, on the Ebonics debate. People getting all mad. I'm going to sit down here. You know, <laughs> bourgeois, Negro intellectuals and, 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 and people, journalists, talking about Ebonics as if it was the worst thing in the world. My God, we're trying to teach our kids Ebonics when we're trying to get ahead in this country and this culture and the whites, what will they think of us? You know, it ain't like they was trying to, you know, kids came to school in the morning, good morning, how are you, fine, and how are you? Oh, no, 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 that's wrong, that's wrong! You gotta speak about this now! Yo, 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 what's up, what's up, what's up, big baby? You know, they acted like folk were speaking so-called standard English and they were trying to mess them up. Oh, no, that's not right, you're not speaking ebonically correct. Not I am, you are, he is, he be, he was, they did. <laughs> hey? They act like Magic Johnson was they teacher or something. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I love Magic, baby. See? See, that, that's how far Ebonics kept him from going, right? Multi-millionaire, owned all them cinemas. Don't speak your kind of English, but he can show a film that you think is proper on his show. Because he owned it. You got to pay him to get into a cinema. That's how far Ebonics kept him from going. Here's my point. <laughs> Ebonics, you know, Ebony Phonics, Brother Williams came up 19, said, I love that other test. He had the B-I-T-C-H test, the Black Intelligence Test for Cultural Homogeneity. <laughs> that was a much interesting, much more interesting test. But what happens is that, you know, Black English, James Baldwin defended and said, listen, if black folk don't have an English, a variety of English, then, you know, it doesn't even, you know, the English language doesn't exist. The point is, is that these are old, try and true rules. That's why they're reissuing William Labov's book. That's why you'll read Geneva Smitherman, Brother Smith. You ought to read all these series, J.D. Dale Dillard's book, 1972, Black English, one of the great books on this subject. All these books, talking and testifying by Dr. Smith, one of the most brilliant books about this. My point is, is that all these folk felt that they had the right and the intelligence to get on TV talking about something they didn't know about. Because after all, ain't nothing but a black thing. You don't need no intelligence to talk about it. I'm saying just about some niggas, you ain't got to, you know, just, just get, on the, get on the TV. People been studying, the, the, the black English is constituted of a variety of linguistic rules that regulate the grammatical and syntactical construction of sentential rationality. I mean, you know, and, and, and we acting like our daddies and mamas ain't spoke no black English. For those of old, for whom this is relevant. Even if it had, maybe, but, but see, black English gets spoke a lot of different places, <laughs> you know? My daddy said, I'm fixing to go to the stove. And when he got gold, he said, I'm fitting to go to the stove. I'll be back directly. That's why I failed math. I couldn't figure that out, man. Geography. I, I didn't ask him, Father, is the point of your departure significantly different than the point of your return? Directly? Right? It's behind the couch before you get there. See, because those are, those are rules, though. They ain't just some people be making up, because you can speak black English wrong and speak it right. See, they have zero copulas. Copulas dealing with the form of the verb to be. You have the habitual be, not I am going, I be going. That's a serious linguistic rule. And I'm Ophelia.
I'd like to motion the minutes to be accepted. Yes, um, what do you mean two people didn't qualify? I don't understand.
Hello, I'm Dr. Jeanette Haynes from New Mexico State University. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction in the College of Education. And today I'll be speaking on behalf of the National Multicultural Interpreters Project to di discuss some of the diversity issues among Native American populations and look at some of the diversity within my own tribal group. I am uh, Zalagi, or otherwise known as Cherokee, and from northeastern Oklahoma, around Tulsa. And so what I will say is I am fourth generation born in Oklahoma. And in a moment, I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means. And in working with Native American clients, there's uh, various issues to discuss. And so how I will start that off is to tell you a little bit more about the diversity within my own tribe to give you a better idea of dealing with perhaps clients from Native American communities. Uh, in talking about sign language, it has had a very important part in Native American cultures. It was historically a very important and viable means of communicating among tribes. And then after contact with non-Indians, it was also very important. So historically, it has a, a very good place. Um, when we're looking at some of the sign language I was shared, it was shared with me that this means Indian or the, I guess, perhaps resorting back to the color of skin somehow, or one may look at that as being um, somewhat stereotypical, because when one thinks of an Indian person, what do you think of? You think of perhaps the features. You think of maybe it's determined upon last names. But oftentimes it is that physical appearance, that skin color is what we think of when we try to determine if someone is Native American. So what I would like to think about or discuss today is what is being Indian? And I want to look at issues of identity and how I'll do that is to explain my own tribal background to you. Um, some of the terms that are used when working with Native people, we hear various terms such as Native American, American Indian, Indian, um, also indigenous people, and then the Canadian groups are referred to as First Nations. So we have again that indigenous quality. And these terms are correct and you will find that depending upon where you are, what region of the country, those terms may be used differently. And when I speak, I use them interchangeably because oftentimes I find if you use just one term, it implies that we're all the same, and we are many.
ったら、ね、ロンパーでねそのうん。
Hi, I'm Martin Haraga. In 1991 and 92, I became involved in, uh, in services to Asians and Pacific Islanders living with HIV and AIDS in Washington, D.C. Prior to that, I had been involved in a group called ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, in both New York City and Rochester, New York. The AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power was a largely dominantly white group of young gay and lesbian men and women who uh, wanted to create change in the world. Well, all of that was fine. A social change movement is what I am about, after all. However, um, in 1992, I began to have an evolution of how I felt about what was really going on. And I felt like the AIDS epidemic had touched so many people in my life. I've uh, had more than 180 friends die in the AIDS epidemic, including a twin brother. Um, that I felt very strongly that I needed to do something different and to focus my energies. So in 1992, I became involved in a small prevention project for Asian and Pacific Islander gay men living in Washington, D.C. And what that meant was, first of all, it meant that I had to contact gay men where they were, and Asian gay men. Now, mind you, I'm, uh, I'm Bolivian born. My ancestors are Japanese. I speak Spanish and English, and I don't really speak any Asian languages. I do speak Thai, uh, because I lived in Thailand for a while. But besides that, I'm not very Asian. Well, I began to do some work with Asians and Pacific Islanders, specifically Filipinos and Vietnamese and Lao and overseas Chinese and some Japanese in Washington, D.C. And we began to do an outreach project throughout the D.C. area, primarily in gay bars and where I would meet Asian gay men um, and talk to them about HIV. But there's a big problem with talking to Asians about AIDS. First of all, there is a huge taboo among Asians against talking about sex, disease, and death. And guess what AIDS is? Sex, disease, and death. Well, that's all right. I would go up to people and talk to them and I found out that I was getting rejected an awful lot. So what I found out was I had to put up parties. You know, kind of like Tupperware parties, where I would give away, you know, the food boxes you get in Chinese carryouts? I'd give away food boxes. Or I'd give away, especially towards the Lunar New Year, which happens between February and March, and it's an important day. Across the different college and university campuses, the Chicano students, <coughs> and not all the Hispanics joined Mancha, uh, it was open to anyone. I mean, you could be black, you could be Jewish, you could be Cubano, you could be French, you know, a foreign student. Uh, membership was open to everyone, but it was basically a Chicano organization. And it was not unlike black student union uh, organizations across, across the United States. What does this stand for? Movimiento. The cult makes are easy to get out of this language. Estudiantil. Chicano confuse de letras A, B, T, A, M, A, B, A, T, L, A, N. Chicano student movement. Aztlan. You want to try to define Aztlan? Aztlan is the mythical land of the north from whence, hence, the Aztecs came. So the, the Aztecs came from a place in the north. All of this is Aztlan. Aztlan. And it's the Aztecs were looking for a place in Mexico. Remember the story? Mm -hmm. They had to find a cactus with a eagle with a snake, and that's what was going to be the North Plan. But they had come from a plan. Up here, the North. They came from the North. <coughs> so then, here the people, they refer to this, the source of the last of the great empires, the Aztec Empire. Aztlan became the Southwest. The Chicano leaders all of claim them. all of the Southwest as Aztlan, as the source 
you know, of the Aztecs as their roots. So in other words, uh, in the Chicano movement, we refer to all of this territory, which um, was lost during the Mexican-American War, all of this is Aztec. And rather than call it of the United States of America, because they're in the United States of Mexico. Talk about points of view when you said this land was lost during the Mexican-American War. When I studied in Mexico, this land was stolen during the American invasion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Absolutely. It's not revisionist history. It's just another viewpoint. It's another viewpoint. America thinks of Woodrow Wilson as a saint. They hate him. He's a jerk. But anyway, that's what it stands for. Mention. Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Atlán. And these students. Hi, my name is Martin Hiraga. Spell my last name, H-I-R-A-G-A. -A. I'm going to talk to you briefly today about a number of things. But before I start talking, imagine a man who was born by mysterious and maybe even miraculous means, who, as a young man, came to a realization of the important place he would have in the world. After which, he spent some time, at about age 30, by himself, meditating, thinking, and planning for his life in the future. After this period of uh, self-analysis and introspection, he then moved on to a public ministry. At his death, there are those who say that this man went on to live another life. Now, if you were thinking Jesus of Nazareth, who is today known as Jesus Christ, you'd be right. But we'd also have to think about Siddhartha Gautama, today known as the Buddha, or Guru Nanak, who is the first Sikh. Those two, those two people, as well as Jesus Christ, lived in an area of the world that we understand to be the continent of Asia. What we're going to talk today about are the religions and the practices of some major Asian religions. Let's start with Hinduism. Okay. Hinduism originated <clears throat> many years before the current era, thousands of years before the current era. In fact, there is no one singular event that led to the origin of Hinduism. However, there are one set of holy books, as it were, or holy chants called the Rig Veda. Rig Veda is spelled R-G-V-E. DA. The Rig Veda are the stories of the panoply of gods 
who inhabit this world and other worlds who have an interest in human life. Some of them are Brahma. The most currently well-known ones are Shiva and Krishna. Recently in Washington, D.C.,